And so is the golden city blackened with each step you take in my hall. Marvel at perfection, for it is fleeting. You have brought sin to heaven and doom upon all the world. Hello everyone and welcome to the video about what will be the cuddliest creatures in Thedas if they ever manage to achieve their goal of wiping out all other life forms. In case of confusion, refer to the video's title. Let's start with an origin story because everybody loves those. According to legend, the first Darkspawn were once men and the seven high priests of the old gods of the Tevinter Imperium. Their gods goaded them to assault the Golden City, seat of the Maker, and claim the godhood waiting for them there. But when they entered the Golden City, they turned it black with their sin and were cast back to the earth by the Maker. They were cursed by the very corruption they brought, twisted by it into grotesques, and then they spread this corruption to others. While this is just a legend, there is evidence that at least some of it is true. What we know for certain, however, is that they were first recorded by the dwarves underground. Since they were underground anyway, they started digging. And they kept digging until they found one of the old gods sleeping in his underground prison. He was tainted and this woke him up. Either he still wanted to sleep or it could have been the taint, but he was very cranky. So he decided that he would lead the Darkspawn in an invasion that would wipe out all other life. And so began the first blight. They first set their sights on the dwarves because they don't like sharing the underground with anyone. And that went... Uh, really well for the Darkspawn. After they almost wiped out Dwarven civilization, they went to the surface and promptly almost wiped out all civilization there as well. Ninety years after the beginning of the first blight, the Grey Wardens were founded. After the founding, the battle slowly turned against the Darkspawn and 192 years after its beginning, the first blight was ended when the Archdemon was killed in the Battle of the Silent Plains. Upon his death, the Darkspawn routed and fled back underground because they really don't like the sunlight. Then they started digging for another old god because, sunlight notwithstanding, they still had fond memories of the surface. They found four more and they all got killed. It's at this point that I start questioning the Archdemon's self-preservation instincts given the attrition rate. When they're not blighting or digging, they fight each other and or the dwarves. Well, they do make occasional trips to the surface in small groups to take in the scenery because tunnels get rather monotonous. To be continued when more stuff happens. So the Darkspawn originates from the time some mortals visited a very vindictive recluse. But as neat a story as this is, it tells us nothing about Darkspawn themselves. So that's up next. Darkspawn bodies recover from wounds very quickly. As a consequence, they never developed any healing arts. They also don't need to eat to survive, but still do, presumably for the pleasure of it. Of course, they do it by tearing into flesh with claws and teeth, with no regard to whether their prospective meal is still alive or not. Since the Darkspawn are more or less made of the taint, it's also in their blood which makes it poisonous. Isabella makes a reference to Darkspawn pissing in Dragon Age 2, but this could just be Isabella being her usual self. They are born to broodmothers in litters of 20 to 50. At birth, they are toddlers and already able to walk. From there, they reach adulthood in only a few weeks. They constantly fight their litter mates so that only the strongest survive. Some Darkspawn are born so much bigger, stronger and smarter than the others that they kill all their litter mates. These will go on to become Alphas. The lifespan of the Darkspawn has never been recorded, but a Darkspawn has been encountered in the Deep Roads that is hinted to be over 200 years old. An obvious hurdle to determining the natural lifespan of the Darkspawn is the fact that they don't really live long enough to die of old age. Their brains work a bit differently than those of untainted creatures. Most Darkspawn are incapable of thinking much because they are completely subsumed by the group mind they all share. As a consequence of that, they also don't speak. But that doesn't make them stupid. They are cunning and capable of sophisticated tactics on the battlefield. They can build crude structures, weapons and armor and despite their appearance, these are very effective. Not as effective as dwarven made stuff, mind you, but they're smart enough to scavenge that too. 
They have also shown ingenuity by binding multiple armor plates and shields together to create a makeshift armor for ogres. And they share knowledge through the group mind so that what one knows, they all do. But the group mind does nothing to prevent constant infighting. The alphas I mentioned earlier rise above others and force them to obey. They become commanders of groups of weaker darkspawn. Some alphas, mostly herlocks, can even serve as generals. Some alphas are gifted with a unique form of magic where they drop power from the taint. These are known as emissaries and are usually only seen during a blight, but if one goes far enough into the deep roads one is bound to encounter them eventually. Such encounters are usually fatal for the adventurer, but on the bright side, actually surviving long enough to meet an emissary is an achievement in itself. Herlock emissaries are under normal circumstances the only darkspawn capable of speech. When there is no archdemon to unite them, various alphas split the deep roads between themselves and fight for territory. This is the reason they aren't a threat on the surface outside of blights. But if they detect an intruder, they will put aside their differences and pool their resources to welcome their guests. They must be pretty good at it too, since complaints are few and far between. It may not be obvious at a glance, but the darkspawn do seem to have their own religion and superstitions. They seem to worship the old gods and or archdemons and they leave bodies of enemies that fought particularly ferociously alone while normally they happily desecrate them. The dwarves believe that this is out of fear of the spirits of these warriors. Now if you've ever seen a darkspawn horde, first of all congrats on surviving that, but more importantly you might have noticed that it is composed of multiple types of darkspawn. I have in fact mentioned a few already and your curiosity might be piqued. Well, wait no longer, for I shall talk about each type separately now. Let us first address the elephant, or rather the dragon, in the room. The one whose awakening heralds the beginning of a new blight, the Archdemon. As I've said before, Archdemons are believed to be tainted old gods. They have tattered wings, holes in their skin through which one can see muscle underneath, and spikes jutting out of pretty much everywhere on their bodies. They lead the darkspawn by transmitting a call through the taint. This call is the means by which the Darkspawn even find the Old God's prisons. The Grey Wardens also hear it since they're tainted as well, and it is described as music or a song. If an Archdemon is killed, its essence travels to the nearest tainted creature. If that creature is a Darkspawn, the Archdemon reincarnates in its body. If that creature is a Warden, however, well, the Warden has a soul already, so both souls are destroyed. So an Archdemon must always be killed by a Warden, otherwise it comes back. But the Warden who kills the Archdemon also dies. It's worth mentioning that the taint in Archdemon blood is much more potent than that of other Darkspawn. That's why the Grey Wardens use a drop of it for their joining ritual if they can get it, but it's not always possible because it's rather rare. Somewhat less rare than Archdemon blood is Genlock blood because there are a lot more of them. They are in fact the most common type of Darkspawn in the underground. They are shorter than the other types of darkspawn, but are well muscled, tough and have some resistance to magic. They also have an intuitive understanding of the underground, which allows them to ambush even groups of seasoned warriors and take them out within minutes. The next most common type of darkspawn is the herlock. They are taller than genlocks and, like them, are strong and tough. They adorn themselves with tattoos to track their kills and deeds, but it's not known if these have a uniform standard or if they're unique to each specimen. A darkspawn you might not see in the horde until it's too late is the Shriek. The scholarly name for them is actually Sharlock, but most call them Shrieks because that's what their battle cry sounds like. They are tall and thin in appearance and are very fast and agile. They specialize in stealth and ambush and are known as the assassins of the darkspawn horde. To that end, they have very sharp claws and teeth and long blades attached to their forearms. Their preferred method of attack is leaping on their target and quickly eviscerating it. While they are less tough than the other darkspawn variants, they are also much harder to hit, so it's very likely that the Shriek will be able to artfully rearrange the contents of your abdominal and or chest cavity before you can land a killing blow on it. They also use poisons, usually derived from their own blood. And as if all that isn't enough, they are able to employ sophisticated tactics when in groups. And the cherry on top, their shrieks, whether intentionally or not, serve as form of psychological warfare because their victims hear them from the shadows and they know they're being stalked. They know what fate awaits them, but can't really avoid it. In opposition to the shrieks' subtlety, we have the ogre's size and brute strength. 
Ogres are the largest darkspawn in the horde, very muscular and have many pairs of horns. Due to their size and strength, they are usually used to break through enemy fortifications and front lines. They prefer to fight in melee for obvious reasons, but at range they still have the option of ripping boulders out of the ground and throwing them at their targets. To get to the enemy quickly, they bull rush. When in melee, they have a few options given their size and strength. They can stomp the victim, punch them, kick them, grab them and squish them or pummel them with the other hand, or smash the ground to make their enemies lose balance. There are around 100 ogres in the horde and they normally stick to it, but there have been reports of ogres hunting in the deep roads alone or in small groups. Aside from rare exceptions, they only appear on the surface during a blight. These are the quote unquote traditional types of darkspawn. But recently new, more unique darkspawn have been appearing. The first of these is the Architect. He is a darkspawn that is able to ignore the call of the old gods and therefore has free will. The other darkspawn can tell that he's different and fear him because of it. This gives him limited control over them, but only if their bloodlust isn't too high. He is capable of using blight magic like the emissaries and is in fact referred to as emissary by most. His goal seems to be to free all the darkspawn from the old gods, stop the blights and find a way for darkspawn to coexist with the other races. To that end he has made three plans that we know of. The first was to taint everyone in Thedas the way Grey Wardens were tainted to make them immune to it, which didn't go anywhere because he picked questionable allies. If he had succeeded however, it would be the death of the vast majority of people in Thedas and the remainder would be unable to reproduce. The second was to give Darkspawn the blood of Grey Wardens to free them from the call, which did work but some of them went mad and turned against him. And the third was to give Grey Warden blood to an old god itself which woke it up and started the fifth blight. The two plans he actually followed through with had terrible unintended consequences and failed to achieve his goals. This would also be the case with the first one if he had done it. It seems to be a theme with him. It is very strongly hinted but not outright stated anywhere that I'm aware of that the architect was one of the former high priests who became the first darkspawn. The darkspawn that the architect freed from the call or awakened are called the disciples. After the awakening they can speak, have free will and choose their own names. They are very intelligent, can think tactically and have command over unawakened darkspawn. As I said before, some of them turned on the architect because the call is very pleasant to them and they resent him for taking it away. The architect's most powerful creation however was the mother. She's not technically a darkspawn but bear with me. She was a broodmother that the architect awakened like the disciples and when the song stopped she went a bit crazy. So she tried to stop the architect's plans and return the song to all the darkspawn. The disciples that turned against the architect rallied behind her and she also had a lot of influence over unawakened darkspawn. She gathered all of these into an army and went to all out war with the architect with the grey wardens stuck in the middle. She went after the Grey Wardens because they were instrumental to the Architect's plans and she wanted to eliminate any chance of them helping him even unwittingly. She is the only known brood mother to date that can use magic. The mother birthed weird mutated darkspawn called the Children. They have three stages of development. The first stage is Child or Grub which just looks like a big grub. This is the stage where they are at their most vulnerable. The second stage, known as Child or Hatchling, comes after eating tainted flesh, usually other darkspawn but it can also be a Grey Warden. They sprout legs which gives them increased mobility. If the Hatchlings eat even more tainted flesh, they will advance to the third stage, Adult Childer. They grow more limbs with spikes at the end with which they can skewer their prey or cut it to ribbons. The children are so horrible even other darkspawn are afraid of them. And lastly, there's Corypheus. He was, by his own words, the high priest of the old god Dumat and one of the seven who entered the Golden City, except according to him, it wasn't golden but black and corrupt. He was sealed by the Grey Wardens after the first blight but accidentally released by the champion of Kirkwall. He then decided to go to the Black City again to claim the empty throne of the gods and become one himself. Guess he doesn't learn very well. He has power over the minds of both Darkspawn and Grey Wardens and can reincarnate in a tainted body like an Archdemon, except unlike an Archdemon he can also use the Wardens. Being a Darkspawn he has access to blood magic but, 
uncharacteristically also human magic, including blood magic, which lends credence to his claims. These are all the Darkspawn variants we've encountered so far. Now let's discuss the thing that makes the Darkspawn such a threat, the Taint. It spreads like an infection and cannot be destroyed, except maybe through the death of the host, so if it's removed from an infected creature, it needs to go somewhere else. But removal is possible only if the creature was infected very recently. All tainted creatures are connected through it, which allows them to sense each other at some distance. This includes Grey Wardens, and both Darkspawn and Grey Wardens can tell each other apart. Where the Darkspawn dwell underground, the taint takes the form of fleshy sacks and tendrils covering pretty much everything. There are also mushrooms underground that contain it, and while they cannot transmit it, they are still poisonous because of it. When the Darkspawn march on the surface, however, they spread it to everything they touch. It gets especially bad during a blight because of their great numbers. It leaches the ground of moisture, withering all the plants, and poisons it so that nothing can grow there for anywhere from years to decades to even centuries. The duration depends on how heavily the ground was blighted. So anyone who managed to flee the horde and somehow survive the blight might not be able to return to where they lived before for the rest of their life because the ground is no longer able to sustain life. The sites of big battles with the Darkspawn are even worse because a lot of Darkspawn blood was spilled and it seeped into the ground, poisoning it even further. After such battles, crows don't even come to feed on the corpses because they instinctively avoid the taint and will not descend upon a battlefield if it's too blighted. Such battlefields take the longest to recover. But there is one known plant that can grow on blighted ground, Felicidasaria, commonly known as the Silent Plains Rose. The taint also causes black clouds to gather over the horde which is so convenient given their dislike of sunlight that it might be intentional. It can spread far beyond blighted areas through infected hosts. There are a number of ways people can contract it. It can remain in an area for centuries after the blight that brought it there and occasionally it surfaces and there's an outbreak. Most often people survive darkspawn attacks but get infected. Other times after the darkspawn win a battle they actively look for survivors and drag them back underground. Some of them are eaten but others get to live for a bit longer. Anyone infected will get one of a wide range of diseases derived from the taint so hopefully lady luck is kind. If she is, they can't handle the taint and die fairly quickly. Somewhat lower on the spectrum, they contract an incurable wasting disease and die in agony. But if they're really unlucky, they become a ghoul. These are mad husks of their former selves, looking almost like darkspawn. As the disease progresses, they grow increasingly sensitive to light, their tissue becomes corrupted and similar to the darkspawns, their hair and nails fall off, and they start to hear the call. This combined with the pain drives them mad and they become part of the group mind. This is usually the point where they start to be referred to as ghouls. They will die eventually, but most advise killing the sick when they start talking about hearing the song. This is because they develop cannibalistic tendencies and will attack anyone around them, including other ghouls, potentially spreading the infection if the victim was healthy. They are used by Darkspawn to fight and build. Being part of the group mind, they are under the Archdemon's control, so they are part of the horde during a blight where they are sometimes recognized by their former friends or family. But being a ghoul's not all bad, there are advantages. The Darkspawn see them as their own and therefore don't kill them, which is handy for those who got lost in the deep roads and consume Darkspawn flesh and blood. They become stronger and also gain some of the other physical attributes of the Darkspawn like not needing to eat and recovering from wounds quickly. Animals also get infected and can be called ghouls but usually aren't. Reaction to the disease varies between species and ranges from losing hair to growing bony spikes to increase in size, strength and aggression to even herbivores becoming cannibals. At least some species get their own names after the change. Some of the well-known ones are Blight Rats, Blight Wolves, Blighted Werewolves, Bear Scarns, which are infected bears, and Dragon Thralls. But a special fate awaits women of intelligent races. They are turned into Broodmothers, which, as I already said, birth new Darkspawn, with the type being dependent on the Broodmother's race. Genlocks come from Dwarven Broodmothers, Herlock from Human Broodmothers, Shrieks from Elven Broodmothers, and Ogres from Kossith Broodmothers. 
The process by which a woman is transformed is never described in detail but it seems to involve at least consumption of darkspawn bodily fluids and being fed a lot of flesh, usually of male ghouls. Fortunately, most can't handle it and die. The survivors are heavily mutated, grow really large and sprout tentacles. These go into the ground and root them to the spot, but they can use them to defend themselves. Despite their unique circumstances, broodmothers are still considered ghouls. Unlike Darkspawn and the other ghouls, they need to feed throughout their entire lives. A broodmother will birth thousands of Darkspawn within her lifetime. Another tainted creature with special circumstances is the corrupted spider. These were once giant spiders that lived in the deep roads and fed on bats, but when the Darkspawn overran the tunnels, the spiders ate them instead. That's how they got infected originally, but the taint became a permanent part of their biology, so they pass it on to their progeny. They now feed almost exclusively on Darkspawn, but will eat any creature that enters their territory. The difference between a corrupted spider and a ghoul is that a ghoul is infected, while the taint is an integral part of the corrupted spider. They also don't seem to be part of the group mind and therefore aren't part of the horde. That's it for this topic. If you want more Dragon Age content, I'd like to direct your attention to Gilder Thalen. I really enjoy her content and she has made more videos about Dragon Age than me, so if you're curious about the lore, take a look at her channel. Link in the description. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.